good evening professor wagre uh, we are having some technical difficulty with dr prachi trying to connect uh, back and uh, okay. uh, though we are live we are just waiting for dr prachi to connect and then okay. you know she can introduce you and you can start yeah. the session sir Fine. so please bear with us for a few yeah no issue sir thank you sir Sir, is uh, is the CV visible, sir? Yeah, it is seen. Yeah, yes. So, once again, it's my proud privilege and uh, honor to welcome you, sir, uh, for this uh, evening webinar on uh, mucor mycosis, uh, the new demon in the COVID horizon. I once again uh, extend a form welcome. Uh, I once again extended a I extend a form well a formal welcome uh, for this evening uh, webinar. I'm we are really happy, sir, that uh, second consecutive month you are addressing the webinar on uh, Shield Connect uh, digital platform. Thank, um, you. thank you very much, sir. And uh, I will now straight away go on uh, to introduce you to the uh, audience. Uh, Dr. Pradyut Wagre is a senior pulmonologist with 34 years of experience, currently professor and head of the department of SVS Medical College, uh, Mahbub Nagar. Dr. Pradyut Wagre is a senior consultant pulmonologist, Apollo Hospital, Hyderabad, and managing director of Kunal Institute of uh, Medical Specialities, Private Limited. He is also a honorary consultant pulmonologist to the armed forces. In recognition of his academic achievements, he was recently conferred with the fellowship of the Academy of Medical Specialities by the Indian Medical Association. He is also a fellow of American College of Chess Physicians and member of the British Thoracic Society and also gold member of European Respiratory Society. He was recently elected as fellow of the Royal College of Physicians, uh, London, United Kingdom. He has many international publications and presentations uh, to his credit. Additionally, he also serves in the COVID advisory board for the Union Government of uh, India. Uh, with this uh, short and a concise uh, introduction of the speaker, I now hand over the session to uh, Dr. Pradyut Bhagre. Over to you, sir. Okay. Thank you so much, um, Uma Shankar, for your kind uh, introduction. And uh, I will just try to share my uh, slide screen. Just let me know if it is visible freely. <clears throat> yes, sir, it is seen. Visible? Okay. Yes, sir. So good evening. At the outset, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to present my views on uh, mucor mycosis. Uh, as we you know, edge away from the second wave, and now we wait with bated breath for the beginning of probably a third wave as it is being uh, prophesized. In between, we have another, uh, what you may call demon on the COVID horizon, which is a mucor mycosis. So what we will do this evening is we will discuss what is this mucor mycosis, how to identify it, how to diagnose it, and then what sort of treatment is available and what are the current guidelines in the COVID pandemic in the management of this mucormycosis. 
So COVID-19, we all know, is caused by the SARS coronavirus 2, and this is associated with the range of opportunistic infections, which can be bacterial and fungal as well. And we are all aware that the second wave of COVID-19 has affected us very badly. And we had a very high number of uh, daily reported cases of COVID as well. And uh, we are also aware that both Aspergillus and Candida fungal infections have been reported as the main fungal pathogens, which is earlier also it was reported for co-infection in these patients. But recently, severe, several cases of mucormycosis were found in people with COVID-19 and they are increasing worldwide. But in India, we actually, you know, dubiously uh, con contribute to the highest number of mucormycosis cases. One of the trials said that out of 101 cases reported so far, 82 are from India. So then why is this occurring so high in India? What are the current reasons? We'll analyze that as we go around. So as I was telling you, since now we are achieving stability with the second wave, but another imminent threat has emerged, which is a challenge to the healthcare workers and the healthcare system in the form of coronavirus associated mucormycosis. That is important, mark the words, it is coronavirus associated mucormycosis. If there is a link between the COVID-19 virus and the mucormycosis. So what are these mucormycosis? They are caused by a group of molds called mucormycetes. It is generally rare, but it, if it occurs, it occurs potentially fatal infection, especially in immunocompromised people. And if it is not diagnosed early and not treated aggressively, it has got a very bad prognosis. Now, often this is referred to as the black fungus because of the pathophysiology affecting, presenting as thrombus and then blackening of the skin and the nasal turbinates. And the incidence of mucormycosis has risen more rapidly during the current second wave when compared to the first wave. So then what are the types of fungi that cause this mucormycosis? This mucormycosis is a relatively old disease and it was identified as early as 1885 when it by uh, Dr. Paltov, when it was labeled as a phycomycosis or zygomycosis. And again, it was in 1957, that Dr. Baker, an American pathologist, coined this term as mucormycosis. Mucormycosis is characterized by certain mold fungi, which are typically NGO invasive in nature, by which I mean they invade the blood vessels and that is how they spread very rapidly. And this uh, group of fungi usually belong to the genus of Rhizopus, Mucor, Rhizomucor, Cunninghamella, and Epsidia, of which it is the Rhizopus oryzae, which is the most common type of the mucor, and which are responsible for almost 60 to 65 percent of the cases of mucor mycosis seen in the human population. And this Rhizopus oryzae accounts for 90 percent of the rhino orbital cerebral form of mucormycosis, which is the very common form seen in the current COVID scenario. And the mode of contamination occurs through the inhalation of fungal spores. So it is the culprit here is the rhizopus oryzae, which is predominantly causing this havoc. Now, this is a very important slide which tells us what happens actually when we inhale the fungal spores. See, as we get exposed to fungal spores, the spores are inhaled and they are deposited in the nasal turbinates or in the lungs. Okay, so through the nasal turbinates, in, they can reach the sinuses and then from there they can spread to the orbit or to the brain. And once they reach the, these spores called as conidia, once they reach the distal alveolar spaces of the lungs, they begin to germinate there. Similarly, in uh, some of the immunocompetent uh, uh, persons, the spores can be inoculated into the tissues with penetrating trauma, which are contaminated by this fungal spores. So in healthy uh, persons with a good immune system, these spores are taken care of by the macrophages and the neutrophils and the mononuclear cells, which actually kill these, the phagocytose, this conidia and kill them and thereby prevent them from spreading and causing NGO invasion and disease. 
So therefore, though this is a very common spore available growing on vegetations and soil, we all inhale these spores, but because of our robust immune system, we are able to stop them here itself and prevent the spread from the nasal sinuses or they don't even enter their lungs. But in the current COVID-19 pandemic, Whenever, because most of these patients have immunosuppression, which we will discuss in the subsequent slides, because of this, the neutrophils, they, the, the, the form by which they attack these hyphal cells, this phagocytic activity of macrophages and neutrophils is inhibited. These are by various mechanisms. That is, these, this phagocytic activity is inhibited by the COVID infection itself by the treatment as such as the glucocorticoids and uh, the diabetes or the hyperglycemia itself, neutropenia due to any underlying condition related or unrelated to COVID can also hamper this phagocytic process of the macrophages. It is also found that acquisition of free iron, which is increasingly seen in hyperglycemic patients and especially those with diabetic ketoacidosis, the free iron levels are increased and these free iron levels increase are also known to support hyphal proliferation. So COVID-19 itself, leukocorticoids, neutropenia, hyperglycemia and free iron load, all these are factors present in the COVID pandemic which actually are preventing the phagocytic activity of these macrophages and neutrophils and thereby resulting in invasion of this fungus into the blood vessels, causing NGO invasion with growth in the tissues, causing hemorrhage, thrombosis and necrosis. That is why you get the black scar and that's how the name of black fungus came. And if this is not checked, it can disseminate and involve all other vessels and can go anywhere in the body. So that is the pathogenesis of how this mucormycosis spreads from the nasal space and enter into the lung and then it goes because of angio invasion it spreads and affects other organs. Having understood the pathogenesis let us see what is prevalence of mucormycosis in our country. Globally if you see the prevalence of mucormycosis it varies from 0 0.005 to 1.7 per million population. It's not that high and not that commonly seen, but in India, it is 80 times higher. It's tremendously high, 80 times higher. That is 0.14 per 1000 when compared to the other developed part of the world. So with the result that our country has the highest cases of mucormycosis reported in the world. Notwithstanding this, we are also having the dubious distinction of the second largest population with diabetes. At one time, we were the diabetes capital of the world, but luckily now we have come down to the second number, but still we have the highest population by sheer worth of the population. We had a high number of diabetes mellitus cases in India. And we know that diabetes mellitus, especially when it is uncontrolled, is the most common risk factor which is linked to mucormycosis in India. But in the Western world, it is mostly hematological malignancies and organ transplantation, which, which form the common causes. So it is diabetes, which is actually, you know, killing these people with uncontrolled diabetes. It is found that one of the surveys found that almost 93% of patients of mucormycosis had hyperglycemia and uncontrolled diabetes and 12% had associated diabetic ketoacidosis. So these are the strong link between diabetes and mucormycosis. And then the primary reason which appears to be facilitating this fungus spores to germinate in people with COVID-19. Why are they attacking COVID-19 people? We never heard of mucormycosis earlier. So there are certain you know, conditions which occurs in COVID-19 patients which make these uh, fungi or mucor to grow aggressively. First, of the ideal environment of low oxygen. COVID-19 patients, if they are having a pneumonia, they have hypoxia. And this hypoxia again, you know, uh, helps this proliferation of this mucor. Number two, high glucose, which can be due to de novo diabetes or existing diabetes, which is uncontrolled, new onset hyperglycemia, which was not diagnosed earlier, 
Many patients, they present with a HbA1c of 9 or 10. They never knew that they are a diabetic unless they were diagnosed with mucormycosis and found to be diabetic. Then third is a steroid-induced hyperglycemia, which are due to the... Uh, people are telling probably the overuse or misuse of steroids, but there are uh, series of reports which say that in uncontrolled diabetic patients, even in steroid and recommended doses used for not more than five to eight days, they have been also known to be associated with mucormycosis, though they are quite rare, but generally it is the misuse of steroids and causing hyperglycemia. The third is the acidic medium which is present in these patients especially if the diabetes is uncontrolled, if they have diabetic ketoacidosis or associated metabolic acidosis due to any other cause of sepsis in addition to COVID-19, this acidic medium facilitates the, you know, the, the production of iron, the increase in iron levels. And this acidic medium itself is one of the conditions which favors mucormycosis in COVID-19 patients. Then fourth cause they mentioned here is the breakthrough infections in patients who are on boriconazole prophylaxis. See, whenever you are in an ICU, if you are getting a high fever, you are on antibiotics invariably. If, you are, if a patient on antibiotics is not improving, what we do generally is we start them on prophylactic antifungals. And the common antifungals which we are all trained and aware are aspergillus and candida. So most of our patients, they are put on boriconazole prophylaxis. So this variconazole is known to be one cause of causing breakthrough mucormycosis infections. That the drug itself is the risk for developing mucormycosis. As I told you, high iron levels due to increased ferritins, which are more present in uh, hyperglycemia and in metabolic acidosis or in an acidic medium, these high iron levels are also a cause for increasing mucormycosis in COVID-19. The decreased phagocytic activity of the white blood cells of macrophages, neutrophils, and mononuclear cells. And this phagocytic activity is reduced due to the immunosuppression, which can be due to various causes. It can be mediated by the SARS-CoV-2 itself, or it can be steroid mediated, or it can be due to any other background comorbidities like extensive or uncontrolled diabetes. The, all these factors coupled with several other shared risk factors, including prolonged hospitalization and ICU stays, either with or without mechanical ventilators. So this is a very important slide because these points, like I repeat again, hypoxia, high glucose, acidic medium, patients on variconazole, high iron levels, decreased phagocytic activity, long ICU stays, with or without mechanical ventilators, these are the causes which are facilitating COVID-19 patients in India to develop this mucormycosis. This again, this diagram uh, explains us the postulated interactions of diabetes, steroids, and COVID-19. If you see on the top end, you see the COVID-19. Here is the COVID-19 by itself, as I said, it increases the levels of cytokines if the patient is going into cytokine storm or even in the COVID pneumonia, we see that the CRPs and D-dimers are elevated. And when it goes into cytokine storm, the interleukin-6 gets elevated. So typically these rise in cytokines, especially interleukin-6, what they do is they increase the level of ferritin. How they increase the ferritin level? They increase the ferritin synthesis. That is, they manufacture more ferritin and they also reduce the transport of iron thereby increasing the level of ferritin and the intracellular free iron. So we just discussed that the more the intracellular free iron, the more is the production of reactive oxygen species and the more production of reactive oxygen species makes them more prone to develop mucormycosis. Secondly, the COVID also causes hypoxia, which we have discussed. It causes lymphopenia, it reduces both the CD4 and the CD8 T cell counts, causes inflammation of the endothelial walls, you know, making them more prone to develop thrombosis and thereby facilitating the NGO invasion of this fungus. Thirdly, COVID-19, as we discussed, can cause metabolic acidosis due to associated sepsis. This metabolic acidosis causes increased endothelial receptor glucose-regulated protein 78 and increase mucorates adhesin spore coat protein cot H. These two factors again increase the angio invasive nature and make these patients to develop more of mucormycosis. 
So this especially due to the COVID itself. And then when these COVID patients are having pre-existing diabetes, or once they are given corticosteroids for their treatment, they result in acute hyperglycemia with already existing uncontrolled diabetes, probably chances are going into diabetic ketoacidosis. And this acidosis, as we have seen, increases the ferritin levels, increases metabolic acidosis, and thereby a combination of this you know, uh, unholy trinity, what we call as COVID-19 plus corticosteroids plus pre-existing diabetes and mucormycosis. All these, they form a, you know, a, a unholy chain and thereby make these patients more vulnerable to mucormycosis. So although the mucormycosis is extremely rare in healthy individuals, we have just seen that several immunocompromised conditions can predispose it. We have just discussed about the uncontrolled diabetes or diabetic ketoacidosis, how they make us more prone to develop COVID. But there are other conditions like hematological malignancies and other malignancies because they may cause neutropenia, organ transplantation because they can be on immunosuppressive drugs like steroids, azathioprine, etc prolonged neutropenia due to any other cause and immunosuppressive and corticosteroid therapy for a long time or iron overload because of repeated blood transfusions for various causes or hemochromatosis. Deferoxamine therapy. Deferoxamine is an iron chelator which was used earlier for iron and aluminum chelation. That itself is known as a very strong precursor to develop mucormycosis. Severe burns, AIDS, intravenous drug abusers can cause uh, endocarditis with, with the uh, this mucormycosis, malnutrition, and open wound following trauma. Mucormycosis can involve any organ, basically. It can involve the nose, sinuses, brain, orbit, lung, gastrointestinal tract, skin, jaw bones, joints, practically everything. And when it invades, it can involve the mediastinum, the pericardium, even the diaphragm. But it is the rhino-orbital cerebral mucormycosis, which is the commonest variety seen in clinical practice, not only in India, but all over the world. And it is one important thing is the speed at which it disseminates, the, the rapidity at which this mucormycosis disseminates is a very extraordinary phenomenon of this fungus. And they say even a delay of 12 hours in the diagnosis could be very fatal. And that can increase the mortality because as they have shown earlier that 50% of cases of mucormycosis were diagnosed only in post-mortem autopsy series. Therefore, it is very important to suspect these cases and go for a fast diagnosis and start the treatment. Rhino-orbital cerebral mucormycosis uh, can, is an entire spectrum ranging from limited sinonasal disease where only the sinuses and the nose is affected to limited rhino-orbital disease, which can progress to orbits, or rhino-orbital cerebral involvement, where there is a CNS involvement as well. And they say the area of involvement, again, may differ from patient to patient and depending on the underlying condition. For example, they say the rhino-orbital cerebral mucormycosis is frequently associated with uncontrolled, hyper, uncontrolled diabetes, uh, hyperglycemia and diabetic ketoacidosis. So diabetics uncontrolled are more prone for rhino-orbital cerebral mucormycosis, whereas it is the pulmonary involvement is often observed in patients having neutropenia due to other causes like malignancies, bone marrow transplants, organ transplants, hematological malignancies, etc. And the GIT involvement gets more common in malnourished individuals. So it depends on which pre-existing condition is there, which is favoring the growth of this mucormycosis, depending on that, that particular organ is affected. The typical pathological hallmark of mucormycosis, as we discussed, is giant cell invasion. It invades the vessels, causes thrombosis, and causes necrosis of the underlying tissue. So giant cell invasion, thrombosis, and necrosis of the tissue is the pathological hallmark of mucormycosis. So what are the signs and symptoms of mucormycosis? Uh, we have read it everywhere. The patient may present to you with facial pain or pain over the sinuses, but they may have pain in the teeth or in the gums. Sometimes they present with paresthesia if they are decreased sensation over half of the face, depending on the fifth nerve being involved. Sometimes they present with blackish discoloration of, of the skin over the nasolabial groove or the LA nasi, or they may have simple nasal crusting and nasal discharge, which could be black 
blackish or blood tinge, which is usually mistaken for a clotted blood on the nasal turbinates, but actually it may turn out to be a mucormycosis. If the eye is getting affected, they can present with periorbital swelling or conjunctival chemosis. If the, if the disease is affecting the optic nerve, they can produce with pain, loss of vision, blurring of vision or diplopia. And that even they can become blind because of the optic nerve involvement. Sometimes loosening of teeth, palatal discoloration or gangrenous inferior turbinates can be present. And as far as the lungs are concerned, there is a worsening of respiratory symptoms, hemoptysis, chest pains. A patient may present you with just dry cough followed by breathlessness, hemoptysis, chest pain, and or sometimes the neurological involvement, they can present with uh, no, uh, persistent headache. I have seen two cases of like this, persistent headache and alteration of consciousness. So having known this, now then how do you investigate and diagnose mucormycosis? See, the investigation and diagnosis of mucormycosis is important because we don't, the time is fast here that we have to act very fast. So if you have a good clinical suspicion and good radiological suspicion of COVID-19 with a background of immunosuppression, you don't have to go for all the cultures and this one because a lot of time will be wasted. As we have seen, as small as 12 hours delay can really cause a havoc. So as far as the investigations are concerned, the non-contrast CT scan of the paranasal sinuses are done very commonly to look for any bony erosions. If there is an involvement of the central nervous system or the orbit, then the MRI brain can be do for, done for a better delineation of CNS involvement. For the lungs, high resolution CT scan of chest is the best investigation to pick up early lesions even when compared to simple X-ray. If this shows, they may show nodules, 10 or more than 10 nodules, a reverse halo sign, CT bronchus sign, etc., which we will discuss subsequently. And uh, sometimes we may have to go for a so CT angiography to rule out any embolus. This is a scan of the 73-year-old man presenting with pain in the left side of the face and in the orbit. The, uh, a is the coronal CT, which shows a soft tissue density you know, here involving the both ethmoidal sinuses and the left maxillary sinus with extension into the extra coronal space of the left orbit. This is where it has extended. This picture shows us the axial CT scan shows soft tissue density in the orbit, which is in the apex region, the red arrow, which is shown here. This uh, CT, these are of the two different patients with bony involvement in chronic mucormycosis. This CT scan shows mixed areas of uh, uh, sclerosis and irregular lysis involving the anterior and middle skull base. Here it is uh, CT showing rarefaction and thickening of the maxillary sinus and adjacent soft tissue density. This is the MRI post contrast enhancing, which shows a hypo, in, hypo intense pattern involving the left ethmoid sinus, which is shown by this yellow arrow. Intense enhancement pattern in left maxillary sinus and heterogeneous enhancement pattern in the left ethmoid sinus and surrounding the left internal carotid artery. So where it is trying to invade the carotid artery. Coming to the lungs, this is the CT bronchus sign, which is, which is endobronchial lesions are commonly seen in diabetics. They can present with a infiltrate or a wedge-shaped consolidation or they can present with multiple nodules, more than 10 in number, or they can present with cavitation, mycetoma. Sometimes they may present only with low bar collapse or only with pleural effusion. Okay, but it is the importance of the, you know, in the background of immunosuppression that if these shadows are seen, don't waste your time for a bacterial pneumonia or other things. Please go investigate fast and treat for mucormycosis especially if we have a nodules of more than 10, either cavitation or associated pleural effusion. Halo sign and air crescent sign are uh, seen in, in mostly one of the series in 12% of these patients had halo sign, but the reverse halo sign, they say, is almost uh, very, very typical of uh, mucormycosis. So what is this reverse halo sign? There is a focal area of ground loss opacities here. 
surrounded by a ring of consolidation, which are seeing the black arrow here. So there is a focal area of ground glass opacities as seen in these three slides, surrounded by an area of consolidation. That is the typical reverse halo sign. If you see these in patients who are immunosuppressed and where you are suspecting mucormycosis, if this picture is seen, you can start the treatment. You don't, you don't have to do any other test. This is seen in almost 20 to 90% of pulmonary mucormycosis because the mortality in pulmonary mucormycosis is so high that you have to add very, very aggressively. Various series have shown patients with leukemia, almost 90% with have this type of picture, leukemic patients and neutropenic patients. Another series showed uh, that with this reverse halo sign was seen in 54% of patients with mucormycosis and only in 6% of patients of invasive pulmonary aspergillosis. So this is a very, very useful sign where you can differentiate from pulmonary aspergillosis and then almost diagnose definitely a mucormycosis. So, but even, even though these findings are not conclusive, they are not you know, diagnostic, you can say, but they are giving us enough indications to start aggressive diagnostic workup and start aggressive treatment. So then the direct microscopy, the best we can do is go for a histopathology and, or uh, some sample and look for a direct microscopy because that's the fastest thing you can do. So direct microscopy where you require optical brightness like blancophore and calcofluoride will show typical hyphae. Hyphae of mucormycosis have certain characteristic features. These are of variable width. That is, this is the sporangiophore, this is the sporangium, and this is the spore. These spores or hyphal spores are usually wide, 5 to 15 microns in diameter. Number two, they are typically non-septate branching. They don't have any septations which are present in aspergillosis. So this is non-septate and irregular ribbon-like branching occurs at right angles at 90 degrees. So three things are important, wide hyphae, more than about 5 to 15 mi uh, microns, non-septate hyphae branching at right angles, that is 90 degrees. If you have these three pictures on the direct microscopy, which can be seen within five minutes, you, you can make a diagnosis. The staining can be done with periodic, uh, para periodic acid shift stain or Crawford gomeries methanamine silver stain, and they highlight this fungal hyphae very clearly. So this is the three points, which is remember, and, and make a firm diagnosis of uh, on the simple microscopy. So microbiological identification of IP based on diameter, as we discussed, of 5 to 15 microns, presence of or absence of septa, and the branching angle, right angle or acute angle, they differentiate it from other fungal infections. Still, the old criteria of 1950 mentioned by Smith and Krishna for the early diagnosis of mucormycosis still holds good. Any presence of black necrotic turbinate, easily mistaken for dry crusted blood. If you do a nasal endoscopy and find crusted blood, think of mucormycosis. Blood tinge, nasal discharge, and facial pain occurring both on the same side, think of mucormycosis. Soft periorbital or perinasal swelling with discoloration and induration, look for mucormycosis. Patient has ptosis of the eyelid, proptosis of eyeball, complete ophthalmoplegia, or if they have multiple cranial nerve palsies, which are not related to the documented lesions, think of mucormycosis and start the treatment very, very fast. If you, uh, the gold standard of diagnosis is histopathology. If it is possible, it is not possible in lung to take a biopsy in these very sick patients where you have to go for a bronchiolar lavage and look for the IP, but in rhino orbital cerebral mucormycosis or skin cutaneous mucormycosis, you can take biopsies and then you will see the typical hyphae are seen as shown here on this slide. And uh, in neutropenic, uh, the, the associated neutropenic or granulomatous inflammation may be present. Uh, this is absent in few cases of immunosuppressed patients. Uh, since this is an invasive disease, so mostly they are characterized uh, by prominent infarcts and NGO invasion. If you are seeing an invasion occurring in the, of the blood vessels, this is a very, very important sign that this disease is going to be rapidly spreading and has a fatal outcome. So invasive disease is characterized by prominent infarcts and NGO invasion or histopathology. Perineural in invasion may be seen in extensive neutropenic patients. NGO invasion is very commonly seen. 
So presence of hyphae, granulomatous inflammation, and signs of angio-invasive invasion. These are the classical signs of histopathology. Having uh, done the diagnosis, now what are the treatment? The golden rules, principal rules of treatment of mucormycosis is again early diagnosis. Please keep it in mind, think about it, look for it, and make a very early diagnosis. And as soon as possible, administer active antifungal drugs. Also, they may require various types of surgical maneuvers to remove or debulk the lesion. Reversal of any underlying immunosuppressive factors like correction of hyperglycemia, stoppage of steroids, any other immunosuppression. Then complete surgical removal as much as possible of the infected tissues. And then use of various adjunctive therapies are there like hyperbaric oxygen, which we will discuss subsequently. So gold standard is early diagnosis, antifungal agents, surgical role, and correction of the underlying factors. Surgery plays a very important role, especially in the rhinoabital cerebral mucormycosis, where removal of necrotic tissue is very important because not only it debulks the lesion, but it also increases the penetration of your antifungal drugs. In pulmonary mucormycosis, usually the patients may require lobectomy if he is fit enough for a lobectomy, but very rarely pneumonectomy or a wedge resection has been done. But most of the patients, they end up getting a lobectomy done and removal of that disease low. It is always important to surround, to remove the surroundingly infected, healthy, uh, healthy looking tissues. They also should be removed because as we know that there is a micro invasion of the vessels always. So always remove the surrounding areas as well. The latest uh, the Director General of Health recommendations for managing mucormycosis from Government of India. They say that mucormycosis is treated with a mix of both surgical debridement and aggressive antifungal medication. The therapy of choice is liposomal amphotericin B as a starting dose of 5 mg per kilogram body weight, increasing to 10 mg per kilogram body weight if there is clinical evidence and radiological evidence of CNS involvement. Okay, therefore, the CT scans and the clinical examination plays a very important role. This liposomal amphotericin B should be diluted with 5% dextrose before use because normal saline and ringer lactate are incompatible with liposomal B, with the liposomal amphotericin B. So only vehicle is 5% dextrose and it should be administered over a span of two to three hours. And the guidelines say you should begin with a maximum dose on day one. So you can start with 10 milligrams and then go for five milligrams per kilogram body weight mixed in 5% dextrose given over a span of two to three hours. It is important to monitor the kidney functions and serum electrolytes during this period, and it must be continued until a favorable response is obtained. There are no particular guidelines how long to give this drug. Depends on the severity of infection, depends on the site of infection, depends on the various comorbidities the patient has, or uh, <coughs> any other long-term immunosuppression it is there. So all these factors will decide how long to give the antifungal drug. Generally, it takes three to six weeks of this liposomal amphotericin B after which oral therapy should be started. Generally, we see the clinical response and the radiological resolution as well, which generally takes about four to six weeks. Coming to oral medication, we can change to isovoconazole, which is not that yet available in our country, but some uh, stocks are there. We give 200 milligrams, one tablet three times a day for the first two days, followed by 200 milligrams once daily thereafter. Or posaconazole, which is available, is available in 300 milligrams delayed release tablets, that is slow release tablets, twice a day on the first day, followed by 300 milligrams once daily after that. <clears throat> and this must be taken for an extended length of time, which varies from person to person. So the physician will decide at that time, depending on the patient's response. <clears throat> Uh, a word about uh, posaconazole suspension, it is also available, but then it has been found that the bioavailability of posaconazole suspension is not that uh, robust. That's why the delayed release tablets have come into the picture. The treatment, as I said, must continue until the clinical signs and symptoms of infection improve, as well as the radiological parameters of active disease reduce and the elimination of predisposing factors are corrected, like correction of hyperglycemia, correction of immunosuppression, etc. 
It may be necessary to administer it over a long period of time. Generally, it takes about four to six weeks of liposomal lipotrysin B. Oral tablets may continue for months together. If for some reason lipo liposomal lipotrysin B is not available, we had a lot of shortage recently, then in such cases only, conventional lipotrysin B, that is deoxycholate lipotrysin B, in the dosage of 1 to 1.5 milligram per kilogram body weight may be used. And it is very important that during this whole management, kidney functions and electrolytes must be regularly monitored. One, another new concepts have come in the treatment of a small word about hyperbaric oxygen. Hyperbaric oxygen, again, is uh, especially useful in skin and uh, skin affection with the mucormycosis, uh, but it is also tried in rhinoorbital cerebral mucormycosis in addition to surgery and antifungal drugs because this hyperbaric oxygen is known to improve the neutrophilic oxidative killing capacity. So thereby it is having some role, but it is not yet freely available everywhere. But if it's available, you can use it for this because that, that improves the neutrophilic uh, oxidative killing capacity. How to prevent this disease? Uh, use masks if you're visiting dusty construction sites because this uh, uh, fungus uh, you know, thrives in uh, decaying vegetables and soil and these leaves and other things. So you have to wear shoes, long trousers, long sleeve shirts and gloves while handling the soil or while gardening and uh, maintain personal hygiene, including thorough scrub bath. When to suspect, again, I want to repeat, COVID-19 patients with diabetes immunosuppressed. If your patient of COVID-19 presents to you with sinusitis, by simple nasal blockade or nasal congestion, nasal discharge, which can be brackish or bloody with local bony you know, pain and uh, pain on one side of the face with numbness or swelling. Don't think it's a bacterial sinusitis. Investigate for fungal sinusitis, mucormycosis. They may have a blackish discoloration over the nasal bridge as seen here. They may present with toothache as a told, jaw involvement, blurred vision, diplopia, pain fever or skin lesions, or they may pre present with palatal eschar because of thrombosis and necrosis. In pulmonary involvement, they may present with dry cough, chest pain, hemoptysis, worsening of respiratory symptoms, and pleural effusion. So what are the do's for doctors? Please use steroids judiciously. Current evidence base, right timing, right dose for the right duration of time. I have seen a 16-year-old girl receiving 64 milligrams of steroids of uh, this one, methyl prednisolone, and uh, that she was receiving for almost, I think, 36 days. So see, when she presented to me, she presented with a blood sugar of 616. So that, that sort of treatment we don't want. We want to use steroids, are good, wonderful drugs in this COVID, but they should be used in the right time, right doses, and right duration of time. There should be a rational use of antibiotics, not overuse of it. Aggressively and timely initiation of amphotericin B therapy. Strict monitoring as well as control of blood glucose, both in admitted patients as well as post-discharge. Because very important to control the blood sugar post-discharge as well. Because this mucormycosis may not be seen when the patient is in the hospital. He will get discharged and go home and come to you with two to three weeks later with this mucormycosis complication. So please manage the diabetes when he is discharged as well. And whenever possible, use insulin in patients with diabetes who are admitted for COVID-19 treatment. With that, you can control the blood sugar aggressively. Keep a very high index of suspicion in presence of risk factors. In sense, daily examine the patient's eyes, nose, and mouth for any signs what we have discussed of mucormycosis. And also very important to use clean, sterile water for humidifiers. This was also one of the causes which was identified uh, as a cause of mucormycosis rise at that time. So it's always important to check for sterile water for humidifiers. What are don'ts for doctors? Don't miss the early warning signs and symptoms. Don't think it's a bacterial sinusitis with a background of immunosuppression. Think of mucormycosis. Blocked nose doesn't always mean bacterial sinusitis. So don't forget mucormycosis. Don't lose crucial time. You may have to initiate therapy in relevant cases even before the diagnosis is made. So if there is good clinical suspicion, good radiological evidence, start the treatment. Do's for COVID-19 patients. Keep the doctor informed about all your comorbidities such as diabetes, hypertension, malignancy, heart disease, etc. Tell the doctor about all what all medications you are taking. 
whether are you on any immunosuppressant drugs or immune related disorders or disease use sterile nice clean mask and maintain personal hygiene immediately inform your doctor if you develop blocked nose and nasal discharge or unilateral facial pain numbness on the face any swelling of the eyes difficulty in vision diplopia or any discoloration around the eyes nose or mouth don't for covid-19 patients please don't self medicate especially don't take steroids on your own see this when this covid-19 came people were asking us sir you are not starting steroids so even the medical staff also used to give steroids now the same patients are if even if you write them steroid inhaler they are telling no sir i will get mucormycosis don't give me steroid so please don't take it on your own but take it when your doctor advises you because he knows what he is doing so in conclusion i would like to say that mucormycosis is seen more common in immunocompromised people for various uh, causes of you know immunosuppression this is this should be suspected in patients not improving on anti aspergillus treatment like buriconazole there are no specific clinical or radiological features which can definitely make a diagnosis therefore the diagnosis is more difficult and challenging in these patients because you have to judge on your clinical features and no no radiological features to support your diagnosis and start aggressive treatment diagnostic options are very limited because we cannot take histopathology from deep seated organs invasive diagnostics have more yield but it is not possible always to get it in some patients early diagnosis means early treatment and leading to less mortality rates because the, the various centers have reported almost 40% to 56% mortality in the west of centers with rhinoorbital cerebral mucormycosis and 80% to 88% in pulmonary mucormycosis and still worst in disseminated mucormycosis it is very important to uh, correct the underlying factors like hyperglycemia or in immunosuppression surgery plays a very important role in rhinoorbital cerebral mucormycosis and liposomal amphotericin b increases cure rates a small word about uh, osaconazole secondary prophylaxis again that is a new thing which has come that if your patient is on immunosuppression if he needs long term immunosuppress medications for example leukemias or some sort of malignancies and if he develops a mucormycosis he gets cured of it you can start him on secondary osaconazole prophylaxis probably lifelong because this immunosuppression is going to stay for a long term and the recurrences of this have seen even one to two years after the first uh, diagnosis is made so secondary prophylaxis with osaconazole is also being tried duration of treatment with antifungal drugs is highly individualized as we have discussed and osaconazole isavoconazole can be tried Uh, along with liposomal and potency b so thank you so much i think i have uh, conveyed most of the things and if any questions i will be glad to answer uh thank you sir thank you very much uh, for that excellent uh, presentation so you have covered almost all the points and uh, i'm sure doctors will uh, get a lot of uh, tips uh, from this presentation as far as uh, treatment is concerned uh so there is one question uh, shall we consider as a mucormycosis as an epidemic uh, as far as uh, india is concerned uh it is not purely academic it's a practical thing because as you have seen we are contributing the highest number of cases to the world and it is affecting the livelihood of people as well so i think this is a uh, we can uh, really call it a demon in the practical terms because that is patients are recovering from covid going home and coming back again so this is the thing which has to be taken very seriously get early diagnosis and start aggressive treatment right so so maybe because uh, the highest number is all, uh, about covid are also high from india so probably that's the reason we are contributing more uh, mucormycosis it is high cases. diabetic is high and thereby the mucormycosis is high from our country right so right so uh so any other tips apart from that uh, from the day to day clinically as far as uh, mucormycosis is concerned uh, would you like to summarize uh, at the end i think uh, what i would like to summarize is uh, please uh, check for diabetes because the, as we said the various trials have shown that almost 80% to 90% of people with mucormycosis were found to be having uncontrolled diabetes Okay. Yes. So check for diabetes. Control it aggressively while he's in, while your patient is in the hospital, and keep a check on the post discharge as well to see that his yeah. blood sugar is under control. That is very important. 
secondly the optimal use of steroids in the right dosage right time you should start the steroids not too early and not too late and give it for the right duration of time don't overuse it or abuse the steroids tell the patients also not to demand from you to give steroids or not to give steroids they should listen to what you are telling Right. And thirdly, keep your eyes and ears open for the clinical signs and the radiological signs. What we discussed of this disease, so that you can make a diagnosis early and start the treatment aggressively. So that will be my take-home message. Right, sir. So thank you very much. Uh, so there are these were the only two questions. Uh, there are no additional uh, questions. Okay. So thank you, thank you for the support and for this beautiful presentation, sir. Thank you very much.